Thank you all. Thank you all very much. It's great to see a full house here, too. Uh, it's story time. I want you to, to relax, get comfortable. It's a, it's a true story. Uh, it's not meant to be sad, though. There's quite a bit of grief in it at times. There's some sadness for me and my family. It does have a happy ending because I am here. Uh, I mean, some of us see things in the newspaper, see them on television. And we think about it, we're touched by it, but uh, later on our lives go on because that's not going to happen to us. It doesn't really affect us, but it's a horrible story for somebody. One day that horrible story comes to your door, comes to your house. And I have to really start off in a way of confessing. I used to support the death penalty. I didn't really think much about it. It wasn't really a concern to me. I kind of believed what, what area I grew up in, and it was only for the worst of the worst, and, and it would, our system did work, and, and so be it. It wasn't no concern to me. But of course, after my experience, I had a change of heart about the death penalty, about the justice system, and really about what to do about it. I, didn't go to my high school guidance counselor in school and say, I want to be a motivational speaker when I grow up. I want to be an activist against the death penalty. Can you put me in prison for 10 years so I got something to talk about? <laughs> However, that is what happened. And really, to begin a story, as, as, you, as you've heard already, I was from a small agricultural town in south central Pennsylvania. I went to the same high school my grandparents went to, the same church my great grandparents went to. Uh, one of those towns where the day you're born, you already have a reputation based on your family's last name, whether it's good or bad. Fortunately, in my case, it was good. But uh, it was a, a good town to be from. The morals, the values, the work ethics, the things you learn as a child. Uh, uh, we still did our chores back then and didn't get paid very much for it at all. Uh, I was involved in a lot of sports. I was in the church choir and I was Lutheran. Uh, my, our area was a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, Lutheran was predominant religion there. So I was in Luther League. Uh, um, but life was good growing up in that small town. I was a blue collar family. My dad worked. My mom stayed at home and made some of the best food there is. Uh, to this day, I have to say that, Mom, but uh, I, I, it really was a, a, a nice place to grow up. And I wasn't quite great at sports. I wasn't bad at school, but my family didn't really have that kind of money if I didn't get a full scholarship to go to college. And so in 1974, when I graduated, I signed up for six years with the Air Force and actually got in under computers, which was something new, but I got, a, got trained in computers in the U.S. Air Force. I got stationed in places like Texas, and then Mississippi, and then Georgia, and then Maine, and then I got sent to Phoenix, Arizona. My six years were up. I liked it out there. It was sunny and warm. Uh, people were from all over easily. There's no people, lots of work. I got out. I got a job at the post office. I'm an outdoors person. I enjoyed, I enjoyed meeting people. Uh, I became a, a letter carrier. And life was good. I never met the love of my life. I hadn't been married. I didn't have any children. All the money that I made was mine to spend. And, and I had a few toys. I had a Corvette. I had a four-wheel drive truck. I had a boat, a motorcycle. I raced stock cars. And I also found myself at bars at times as I played a lot of sports, uh, everything from pool leagues, dart leagues, softball leagues, bowling leagues. And that's where my trouble arose from. The local owner of a neighborhood bar, not more than about a half a mile from my house. Came in on a Sunday morning to open up his establishment, found the front door unlocked. He thought, hey, what's going on here? How comes my night manager didn't lock this, secure my, my business? Right away, he made his way over to the cash register. There was a the cash register standing wide open. He went through it, the money, the checks, the things appeared to be there, okay, but he was still wondering why this wasn't secured, put away in a safe. So now he made his way over to his office where the safe was. And there was the safe. It was closed. As soon as he pulled on it, it opened right up. It wasn't locked. Again, he went through all the contents, making sure his assets, his most important thing, his money, was okay, and, uh, but still wondering, confused, why this hadn't been secured. It appeared that the bar had been cleaned. The stools were stacked on top of the tables. The trash had been taken out. As he made his way through his bar and restaurant area, when he came to the men's bathroom, there he found Kim and Kona's body, lying in a puddle of blood. She had been stabbed in the back. All she had on was her socks. She was dead. But of course, the police were called, and they initiated this investigation under the assumption that this had to be somebody that knew her, somebody had a personal history with her, a relationship with her. So they called in her, her co-employees, asked her who she'd been seeing, who she'd been dating, who does she like? And one of the girls mentioned my name. 
unbeknownst to me, there was no relationship with, with her. But one of them told the police officer my name. And a few hours later, as I said, I lived close by. A few hours later, I was sitting at my house about 1 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and I heard my dog bark. It was a big Doberman. He didn't bark much. When he did, I paid attention. And I looked out the window. I'd seen a car had just pulled up in front of my neighbor's house. And two men in suits had got out of that car and were, were walking around it. And I went out to let my dog in, and by that time, these two men were walking up my driveway. So I stepped out and said, excuse me, can I help you? One man looked at me and said, are you Ray Crone? I said, yes, I am. What can I do for you? He said, do you know Kim and Kona? I thought a minute and said, no, I don't think I know anybody named Kim and Kona. He exchanged glances with the other man standing next to him. He, he said, you, you don't know Kim and Kona from the CBS Lounge? I said, wait a minute. I play in their volleyball team there. I, I shoot darts sometimes there. There's a girl who works there named Kim. I, I don't know her last name. Again, he exchanged glances with the man next to him. He looked back. He said, you don't know her last name. You're her boyfriend, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not her boyfriend. What's going on here? He said, well, you're dating her, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not dating her. What is this about? And that's when he opened up his jacket, pulled out his badge, identified himself as a homicide detective for the Phoenix Police Department, informed me of Kim's murder, and said he was there to ask me a few questions. Now, I was stunned. I was startled. Here's somebody I knew vaguely, an acquaintance I've been going to the bar about two months, was, was a murder victim. And the police were at my house to ask me questions? First thing I said was, sure, come on inside. I invite him into my house. He said, no, we really need to do this downtown. And a black and white police car pulled up. I was put in the back seat of that, taken down to the Phoenix Police Department, and grilled for the next three hours about how long have we been dating, where did we go out on dates, how many times she over my house for dinner, on and on and on. All this while I kept telling him, look, she's never been to my house. We don't date. She lives with the man. You know, I see her at the bar sometimes. During this three hours of grilling, at one point he had me take my shoes off, my sneakers, passed them out to an officer. I got them back about an hour later. Another point he had me take my shirt off, took pictures of my upper torso. Uh, later on he took and fingerprinted me, took mug shots of me. All the while going back to boyfriend, girlfriend, where did you used to go on dates? How many times have you been to your house? I kept telling him, it didn't happen. It's not the way it is. And that's not the way it was. At one point, even he had a piece of styrofoam, almost like come out of an insulated coffee cup, the white, soft stuff. He had two of them, actually, it was, taped together. Had me bite into that. I didn't know what this was about. He wasn't feeding me any information. There was nothing in the news yet. I was just cooperating. Finally, after three hours, I was taken home. I thought that was the end of it. I didn't kill her. I was home in bed. I have a roommate that knows I was home last night. I, I don't know her or her friends that well. I don't know why anybody would want to kill her. Well, the next day was a Monday. I delivered my mail that day. I got back to my house that evening. There was Detective Gregory, the man that was there the day before, waiting for me. He said, well, I'm not sure you've been completely truthful with me. He said, you know, you want to cooperate, don't you? I said, yes. I said, of course. He said, well, I need to eliminate you as a suspect. He said, I need you to come downtown with me. I thought, well, okay, if I have to. And he put me in this time. He put me in the front seat of his detective car, an unmarked car. And we went down to that same little interrogation room. Only this time when I stepped in and went to sit down, the door was slammed shut behind me. He pulled out a piece of paper. He said, oh yeah, and by the way, I have a search warrant here. And you're gonna give me a blood sample, a hair sample, and a cast of your teeth. And he showed me the paper, I got it, I read over it. It was signed by a judge, and at the bottom it said they had three hours to take these samples. So I cooperated. I cooperated when he took blood out of both arms. I'm not sure he realized it was the same. <laughs> I, I cooperated when they took a hair sample, and they don't take a hair sample with scissors. They actually pull it out by the roots from all over your body, put it in little envelopes. I cooperated through that. Then I was taken next door in a bigger room. They had a dentist chair set up. They had a dentist there, sat me in that chair, these big metal plates, molds with goop they put in my mouth, took two casts of my upper teeth, two casts of my lower teeth. And, and put this plastic apparatus in my mouth, had my mouth spread open, taking pictures of my teeth, pulling, having me snarl and grin. And all the while I was answering some questions, telling the history of my dentition. My teeth weren't always straight, even if you will. Uh, that's actually the result of extreme makeovers, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but I, I sat there and suffered through this. Um, and I told the history of my teeth. When I was about 18 years old, I was a passenger in head-on collision. I woke up the next day in the hospital with my mouth wired shut. I had a broken jaw. The six weeks went by, the wires came off. Uh, my bottom jaw didn't match up to my top jaw. They had to re-break it and wire it shut again. 
another six weeks. So of course after that time now I had some teeth that had died, some root canal problems, some things that had to go on, some gum disease and ended up with some root canals, some implants. Fifteen years later they weren't even in straight anymore as they'd started out by the, US, or by the Air Force dentist. And I explained this to them while they're poking around in my mouth. And, and I was careful. I didn't bite in the corner in a cob. I wasn't chewing on fresh apples. And here they were for two and a half hours, this dentist. Finally he was done. I was taken next to her back into that little interrogation room. I went to sit down again. He banged on the desk. He said, look, it's time to come clean. It's time to tell the truth. I know you did it. Why don't you just confess so we can all go home? Well, I had enough. I mean, my honor, my integrity is something I was always proud of, something my family and friends recognized in me, something certainly the U.S. Air Force must have recognized me, me, my honor, my integrity. I had a top secret clearance for the job I did for six, six years, something the U.S. Postal Service must have recognized when they gave me a job, hired me as a mailman to handle people's personal property, their mail in and out of their homes. And here's a detective that doesn't even know me, calls me a murderer and a rapist and tells me to confess. I came up out of my seat. I told him what I thought of him, what I thought of the investigation, what I thought of the police department. I said, why are you bothering me? Go find the people that did this. And by the way, your three hours are up. He looked at his watch. He looked back at me. He said, look, I'm not going to argue with you. There's other ways to handle this. And he took me home, which, of course, is what I wanted. I, by then, I'd been there about three and a half hours, and I was tired, and I was frustrated. I was, was angry. And I was taken home. And again, I thought that was the end of it. Well, I found out what he meant by other ways to handle this the next day. December 31st, 1991, New Year's Eve, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I just got done delivering my mail that day, coming home to make New Year's Eve plans. Just stepped out of my car in my driveway. All of a sudden, I heard the screech of brakes, the sound of slamming doors, people yelling, freeze, don't move, you're under arrest. I look over my shoulder, it's a van load of police officers, full ride gear, guns drawn, throw me on the ground. Rest me, handcuff me, and charge me with murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault, and Kim's death. Drag me off to the Maricopa County Jail. It's right there in Phoenix. Uh, for some of you might have heard of the self-proclaimed toughest sheriff in America. That was where I was put, a place where they made us wear pink underwear. They had a chain gang for women, tent city in the desert for inmates. That's where I was put. I'd never been in jail before. I hadn't been in prison. I didn't even watch it on television. I didn't even have detention in high school. I don't know, that might make me sound a little lame, a little nerdy, but I mean, you, you don't go to your wrestling coach, say, coach, I got detention tonight, you know, I'm going to miss practice. That's not going to be good when you finally get back to practice. And here I was around a whole lot of people I knew I was not going to like. But you know what I was thinking about? Did I lock my car? Who's feeding my dog? I got a big softball tournament this weekend. They need me to pitch. You see, I was stupid. I was naive. I actually believed the police were out there continuing their investigation, going to find out that everything I told them was the truth, and I'll be out of here any minute. Uh, then it's any hour. And then it became days. And then weeks. And surviving the violence, the deprivations that our jails are, uh, told my family and friends not to worry. I didn't do anything. And, you know, it'll work out because I, I didn't do it. I was 35, about to turn 35 at the time. They knew me. I'd established myself, my reputation through, through them. They believed in me. And some of my friends there in Phoenix that knew lawyers, they were a little concerned when I was still in there. They'd send their, their attorney in to see me. The first thing, of course, I want to know is how much this is going to cost me. They say, well, you're looking at a $20,000 retainer, probably another eighty dollars to $100,000 in expenses. I'm like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. I make $30,000 a year at the post office. I bought a house seven years ago for $50,000, and now I'm supposed to come up with $100,000 to pay you to defend me for something I didn't do, and I'm not going to get that money back? He said, yes, Mr. Crone, that's about how it is. My little country pragmatic mind says, look, I'll be fine. I didn't do it anyway. I'll be out of here any day. And after about a month in there, I was finally called out to a legal visit, and this time a lady came in, sat her briefcase down introduced herself as my representative from the Phoenix uh, Public Defender's Office. And then she said, you've been charged with murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. Now, you can expect to be found guilty, but we'll fight it on appeal. And I went crazy. What do you mean I'll be found guilty? It had nothing to do with this. I just started going off. 
She held the phone away from her. This is one of those where it's non-contact. You're looking through a piece of glass, and each of you's got a phone. She got the phone held away from her, hand held up. I'm quieting down. Finally, she said, listen, Mr. Crone, I don't take that tone of voice from the judge. I don't take it from the prosecutor. I'm certainly not going to take it from you. Hung up their phone, picked up a briefcase, and was gone. Never seen her again. I got notice a few weeks later by mail that the public defender's office were removing themselves from my case. They cited a conflict of interest. They said the mo next most likely suspect in this murder was Kim's ex-husband. Uh, they had a daughter together, a teenage daughter. She had a sleepover at her dad's house. He did something inappropriate with one of the little girls and was arrested for it. it was being represented by the public defender's office. So they told me I was going to get a, a court-appointed attorney. I thought, yeah, right on. I'm going to get somebody decent. Now somebody knows what they're doing, not like this last group, and it was going to be paid for. I thought it was going to be fortunate because I'm still in here, but I'm going to be out soon, I thought. Well, that attorney, when, well, that day I was in the court and they appointed this man to represent me. Uh, maybe he would have been a good attorney. Maybe he was a good attorney. I don't know. It wasn't my experience with him. But right after he was appointed to represent me, the courts went on to granting $5,000 payment to cover his handling my case. $5,000 to represent me in a capital murder case. You can't even get a divorce for $5,000. So I got what they paid him to do. He wanted me to take a plea bargain. I, of course, told him what to do with that. I've interviewed just a few people, me about two times. Just seven months after they found Kim's body, seven months after I was arrested, I'm sitting in the courtroom. I'm facing the capital murder trial. And I found out why they had me bite into that piece of styrofoam, why that dentist was so important to come out there that next day. Because I wasn't there and I didn't kill her. They didn't have any evidence. So the prosecution hired a bite mark expert. Let me put that in quotation marks too. A bite mark expert was hired by the prosecutor who testified at my trial that bite marks in the body matched my teeth, that my teeth were unique as a result of that car accident, that that bite happened at the time of her death. So that made me Ray Crone the murderer. The man was very impressive, very well groomed, very experienced. He was the, the, the dean of the UNLV Dental School. He was a state senator from Las Vegas. He was an elder in the Mormon church. The curriculum vitae goes on and on. Very proud of each and every one of them items. Uh, very impressive, as I say, uh, very convincing. Uh, also, we later found on very well paid. We found out later on that the prosecution had paid this man over $50,000 for his testimony in my case. That trial, as you heard, lasted three and a half days. The three days was the detective and the bite mark expert. The last half a day was the defense. I took the stand, raised my right hand to testify, tell the truth, answer my attorney's questions, and here come the prosecutor. So you deny killing him at Kim and Conan? Yes, I do. So you deny being at the CBS lounge? Well, what night? Well, the night of the murder, of course, Mr. Cronin. Are you going to be argumentative? You know you're on trial here for your life. You know you've been lying all this. He just started tearing into me, folks. I mean, for the next two or three hours, it was just whatever I said. Well, now you're lying. You said this. I mean, just right at me constantly. I'm telling you, folks, when I came down off that witness stand, I was so, like, confused, so disoriented. I almost went over and laid down next to him. Next was my roommate. He was staying at my house at the time. He was, Steve was going through a divorce. Most of his whole paycheck was going to his children, his child support. I always had a spare, spare room for, for anyone. He raised his right hand to tell the truth. He answered my attorney's questions. Again, here come the prosecutor to cross-examine him. Stood there in front of him for a minute and said, now, now you've known Ray Crone a long time, haven't you? Steve said, yes, that's right. We've been 12 years now since we were in the Air Force together. And the prosecutor looked at him and said, and all Ray Crone's always been a good friend to you, always been there in times of need, times of trouble, looked out for you, helped you out. In fact, he even given you a place to live right now, isn't he? My friend Steve straightened up and said, yes, that's right, that's the kind of guy Ray is. The prosecutor leaned over and said, you'd lie for him, wouldn't you? Turned and walked away and sat down. That's how he cross-examined my friend who raised his right hand on that court of law to tell the truth. The same friend who raised his right hand to serve in the United States Air Force took that oath. In less than 30 seconds' time, that prosecutor called him a liar, told that jury to disregard whatever he has to say because he's just lying to protect his friend, a murderer. It took the jury just three and a half hours to find me guilty. Found me guilty of murder and kidnapping, and they acquitted me of this sexual assault. It's hard for me to believe. It's hard to understand. Well, all of it was hard for me to believe. But, 
But to see the, the prosecutor's theory, the motive, he said, was I went there at closing time, allegedly to help her close, as one of the bartenders told him. Then I went there to help her close, and then I, she refused me sex, so I forced myself on her, and then had to kill her to silence her. That's what he said, the theory, the motive, the reason I killed her. I was acquitted of the sexual assault. About four months later, I'm before the judge for sentencing. At that time in Arizona and some, a few other states, uh, the, the guilt phase was handled by the jury. They were dismissed, and then the, the, the sentencing phase was handled by the judge. And it's a little mini trial. It's called an aggravating mitigating hearing. The first part, the aggravating part, is put on by the prosecution. This is where they argue why this is above and beyond the norm, so outrageous, so horrible, uh, that it deserves the death penalty, merits the taking of someone's life. And the, uh, the uh, prosecutor argued the bite mark. He said it was, you know, excessively painful, excessive pain and suffering that Kim must have went through if, if she, when she was still alive and this bite mark was on her, her breast. Or he said, because he was very good at covering all angles, all possibilities, no matter how extreme. Or he said, it was just after she was dead, just after she'd passed, uh, and, and that was tampering with a dead body. That was necrophilia. That's just heinous and depraved. The judge ruled that that was an aggravating factor. And then it's the defense's turn to put on what they call mitigating. As you know, mitigating means to ease, to lessen, to abate. Some people think it means to make excuses. But, but now it's turn to put on the mitigating. I want you to think about something for a minute. How do you mitigate something you didn't do? How do you show remorse or regret for an act you never committed? Normal mitigating standards, statutes, or examples were drug or alcohol impairment, a history of mental illness, uh, you know, a history of abuse. I told my attorney, I got nothing to mitigate, I didn't kill her. He said, well, we'll put your family, your friends on, testify your good background, your good behavior. I said, you're not putting my mom, my sister on the stand, I'm cross-examined by that prosecutor, no way, it's not happening. He said, well, you're gonna have to tell the judge that. So I did. <laughs> So I, mean, I got no remorse, I got nothing to mitigate. I didn't kill her, you got the wrong person. And so I was labeled a cold-hearted killer, a remorseful monster. I was sentenced to death, chained up, and taken away to Arizona's death row. Put in a cell the size of most of y'all's bathroom at home, six by eight, center block wall on three sides, steel bars in the front, a, a heavy metal door with a, a slot about this big, we used to call it the trap. That's where they fed you through. You better be there when your tray came around to get it because it was only about a four inch wide ledge and it fell over on the floor. It's like, oh well, sorry about your luck. One well, of the way the guards could get back at you or have fun with you. I never got a hot meal on death row, ever. See, you don't let people on death row, not the monsters, not these horrible killers work in a kitchen. I mean, my God, there's too many dangerous weapons in there. We can't have these men working around that. Our food was prepared in a mineral yard, put in a cart, and wheeled over in our area, and it sat there until they felt like fiendish. It might come sometimes at 9, 10 in the morning, and if it was warm, we were lucky. I had a cement slab for a bed. It had a pad on it about an inch and a half thick. I got a one army blanket, a sheet, and one towel. I wrapped my tennis shoes in my towel. That was my pillow. I got out of that cell three times a week for two hours. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday was our wreck day. Officer would come to your cell. He'd strip down, take every piece of clothing off, pass it out through that trap. He'd pat it down, rub it, and look at it, make sure you weren't hiding anything anywhere in the clothing and your sneakers. Then he'd look at you through the cell bars, and you'd have to lift and twist and bend and turn around and make sure you weren't hiding anything anywhere on your body. He'd pass those clothes back in. You would get dressed right there in front of him, put your hands out the trap where a piece uh, a pair of handcuffs was placed on your wrist with a leather strap attached. You'd turn around that belt that the strap was would be fastened behind your back. You couldn't move your hands any more than this. He motioned to the officer outside the cell block, looking in through the window to rack your door. The door would open up. You'd take one step out away from the door, turn and take one step away from the officer, and freeze. And it better be one step and only one step, and it better be in those directions. Because anything else was either considered attempted escape or assault on staff. They grabbed you by the belt, kicked the legs out from under you, and bounced your head off anything you could find. And that happened plenty of times. But then you were patted down. When you stood there, you were patted down to make sure no, you didn't hide anything in the last minute when you just dressed right there in front of him. 
And then you had an 18-inch chain put around your ankles. They called out, clear the cell, clear the cell block, dead man walking. And another officer came in then, and you were escorted by two officers shuffling out the cell block, down the steps, out in the hallway, outside for about 50 feet out into the desert where there was a 10-foot square slab of concrete. Had a 10-foot high, a chain-link fence with a chain-link across the top, and you were put in there for the next two hours by yourself. That was my little vacation, my little escape from my box, my, my home, my cell. Feel that sunshine on me, maybe see an airplane fly over, maybe hear a car horn honk, maybe a motorcycle engine, maybe a lawnmower, maybe even a dog barking, something to remind me that I was still a human being, not that monster they were keeping in a, in a cell that they were going to kill one day. I beat myself up those first weeks, months, why me, what I do to deserve this. My family and friends were there by me. They sent my folks sent the Bible in. I reunited with my faith again. Started reading the stories of Job and Jonah, finding strength in some of the passages. Out of the darkness shall come the light. Rejoice in trials and tribulations, for you shall find favor in the sight of the Lord. And I was able to pick myself up somewhat. I realized if I'm going to fight this system, I better know this system. I started going to the law library when they still had law libraries. I was actually up there so often, uh, I ended up becoming a legal, legal rep, helping other inmates work with their cases, both inside internally disciplinary issues and also with their outside appeals. I actually was offered in to work in the law library, one of only four men on Arizona's death row that got to work in the law library. Meanwhile, my case was making its way through the Arizona Supreme Court. And during this almost three years I was on death row, at one point I, I, all my family there lives around that little area in York County, Pennsylvania, except I had to, my mom's sister, which would be some type of aunt, I'm not sure, second, third, how it goes, but it was my, my grandma's sister had actually gone to college at Ohio State back in the 40s and met a man from the military, moved to California, and she had three boys. I'd, I'd seen Aunt Dorothy a number of times. She would come back to visit her sister. And, and the nieces and nephews, and I knew Aunt Dorothy, I'd never met her sons. And one day while I was sitting on death row, I got a letter from a Jim Ricks in Lake Tahoe, California. And here was one of my second cousins. And, he, and I, apparently they were watching a TV show one day with his mom and something about crime and punishment. And she said, well, you know, you got a cousin on death row in Arizona. He's like, he's shocked, he's stunned. Like, wait a minute, there's something I don't know about my family. We've got monsters in it. Uh, he, was, he was concerned. Uh, also, enough so that he wrote me, wanting to know what, what this was about. And I wrote back, and uh, you know, I had a little three-page explanation, you know, and what talking about family and, and my honesty. And, and I told him at the end, I said, you don't have to believe anything I said, but it is the truth, and if you ever care to look into it, it's, it's all there. And he actually gone to school with a man at Fresno State. He'd actually gone to school with a man that was an attorney at that time in, in Phoenix there. And this man said, there's only three and a half days. That's not a lot of trial transcript. He was able to get copies of it and send it to my cousin. And next thing I know, I got a visit from my cousin there on death row. And he talked to me for the two hours that we were allowed. And he, at the end, he said, you know, I believe you. And he was an entrepreneur. He had his own software company. He wasn't Mr. Gates. I might have been out a lot sooner. But he did have the, the, the means of, to investigate a little bit of this. And he was actually able to get a hold of some of the bite mark evidence. He was able to get a hold of, the, of some of the pictures. And he was actually able to take it to a bite mark experts and show them this. And he took it to three different men, and all of them said it's not a match. You can imagine that was good news for me and my family. And so they hired an attorney. My family got, wanted to hire an attorney out of Southern California to, to represent me in what to call a special action to, to get, get this new case opened up. In the meantime, as my case was making its way through the Arizona Supreme Court, I have to say, God bless my worthless attorney because he actually did have a good day in trial. Actually, it was the day before my trial started. Uh, on that Friday, uh, the trial started Monday. On that Friday, the pro they had me into the, into the court. The prosecutor introduced a videotape made by this bite mark expert. Very impressive videotape that uh, uh, depicted how he matched my teeth up to this bite mark. And, just about 45 minutes long. My attorney was awake. He was actually paying attention at the time. He objected to the admission of this evidence. And the judge says, overruled. He said, I'm going I'm to allow this, this videotape to be admitted. And, and then in a burst of brilliance, probably never again recreated in my attorney's career, he said, Your Honor, in light of that ruling, I'm going to have to ask for continuance. I'm going to need 30 days to prepare for this videotape that you're allowing in. The judge said, denied. You know, we, we need to get this trial rolling. 
And he, he never ruled in our favor anything. He was an ex-prosecutor. He was responsible for half a dozen people already on Arizona's death row. And of course, when the Arizona Supreme Court reviewed this issue, they recognized it for what it was. It was a violation of the rules of discovery. As a defendant, you have a right to know what evidence is going to be used against you. You have a right to receive it in a timely manner. They're not supposed to hide it. They're not supposed to withhold it. Uh, they're supposed to turn it over to you so you can act upon it. And so the Arizona Supreme Court said the prosecutor should have turned that over. They said the judge was wrong. But just because there's a mistake and error and omission does not mean you go free, does not mean you automatically get a new trial. There's actually two parts. The second part is called harmless error evaluation. And this is where they look at this evidence, this omission, this mistake, and this error, determine whether or not it would have made a difference. Did it matter? Would it have affected anything in the, in the jury's mind? And their exact words when they did their harmless error evaluation was, without this videotape, there wasn't even a jury submissible case against Mr. Crone. They recognized it for what it was. This was all about the bike mark. I was called the snaggletooth killer in the papers. So they ordered a new trial. And as I left you hanging earlier, when I said about my cousin and worked on, on that bite mark and had talked to some local bite mark expert and started hiring an attorney to represent us in, in a, 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 what they call Rule 32 post-conviction relief proceedings, now I was just ordered to stand a new trial. And this attorney, Chris Poor from Southern California, said, let me take the case. I want to work on Ray. I believe in Ray. When I've looked in it, it's, he's innocent. Let me do it. We didn't have the hundreds of thousand dollars to come near what he, what he would normally ha have asked. He said, look, I believe in him. Just cover the expenses. That trial started in February of 1996. As I said, we didn't have the money. My folks mortgaged their house, cashed in the retirement funds. My high school had a 50-50 drawing, take up donations for my family, for my defense. Local churches had bake sales and homemade goods sales to get my family money to, so they could come out and sit at my trial, six and a half weeks long. Over 500 exhibits were introduced. Over two dozen experts testified. Three bite mark experts we brought in to testify for me. The local newspaper, the York County newspaper, sent a reporter out to cover the whole trial. My attorney, who was a, was a very experienced attorney who knew what he was doing, noticed that the, the police reports was in a little loose leaf binder, that it was skipped from 23 to 37, 52, and to 65 was missing. He petitioned the courts to get all the police reports. We finally got them. They finally turned them over. They charged my family $700, copying fees, they said. We requested all the photos. We originally had a stack about the size of two decks of cards. Requested all the crime scene photos. We finally got them through the judge's orders. They turned them over to us, a whole shoebox full. Charged my family $1,400, copying fees, they said. I thought as a defendant, you have a right to that kind of evidence. They realized it was my family, my money, and they were just trying to break us. But the truth was coming out. We had found out that way back in 92, they had taken a swab from her breast. DNA was just becoming, just, just becoming known. And, and they'd actually sent that DNA off to, a, to a, a DNA lab in Colorado and came back that it didn't match me and they didn't tell us about it, but we were able to find out about it. By now it was so, so small uh, area left in that Q-tip that they said was well, not usable anyway, and that's why we didn't tell you about it. Well, we got Dr. Blake out of California, who was, came out with a new procedure, I think it was PCR, where you can take the least amount of DNA and, and clone it till you got enough to work with. And we were able to get those last little Q-tips and have it tested. And the saliva from the bite mark that I'm supposed to make was not my DNA. You can imagine how good that felt to hear in court to be able to turn around and smile at your mom and your sister and almost want to hug your attorney. Finally, the truth was coming out. But I still didn't get it. <laughs> I still didn't realize how important a capital murder case is for the careers of a prosecutor. You better, that's the feather in your cap that you better get. You better get a conviction no matter what in that capital murder case. If you want to ever go on in your career field, if you want to climb that ladder, become head DAs, attorney generals, maybe even governors, you better get a capital murder conviction. You don't want that to slip away. This is a monster you would be releasing if you did. I still didn't know how far that prosecutor was willing to go. I can tell you one example, though. Prosecutor is the last person to address the jury before they go out to deliberate. The very last words are spoken from his mouth before they enter that room and start deliberating. 
And that prosecutor stood in front of that jury, told him to disregard the DNA, ignore the DNA, it was meaningless. We know who committed this horrible murder. He's sitting right here in this courtroom. And you as a jury is responsible to see that justice is done for Kim and her family. Don't let the defense mislead you. That's all they've been doing this whole, whole trial. He said, that DNA, that DNA is easy to explain. She's a waitress, a waitress. She handles glasses and bottles all day long. That was just transferred there by accident from somebody else's glass. The jury was out for three and a half days. Came back and found me guilty again. Now, it was a little bad the first time, but I was dumb the first time. I didn't think anything was going to happen because it doesn't in America when you're innocent. But by the second time now, I've been not to law school, but I've been to the law library, and I knew a little bit about crime and punishment, a little bit about reasonable doubt. Oh, this one hurt. This one stunned me. I'm like, whoa, back up. You know, go on now, start over. You're just kidding. At least start today over. That's the only day that really matters. Go on now. And I look over at the jury, and they're wiping the tears out of their eyes. And the judge can't hardly finish reading the verdict. His voice is breaking up. My big attorney's hanging on my shoulders. My God, Ray, I can't believe this. I don't, what were they thinking? But it's not over. I'm with you, Ray. I'm with you to the end. I won't quit you. And I look over to the prosecution. They're jumping up and down, high-fiving it like they just won the big game. Oh, that hurt, folks. But that ain't what almost knocked me to my knees, but what ripped my heart out. You see, when they said guilty, I heard this most horrible wail, this scream, this moan from my mom and sister not five feet behind me. They turn around and see that look in their eyes. I say, don't worry, Mom, I'll be okay. Amy, don't cry, it'll be all right. I'll be all right. This was my little sister. See, they weren't just doing it to me, they were doing it to my family. Yeah, this hurt. Again, five months later, I'm before the judge, the same story, the same aggravating circumstances. It came time for the mitigating. I said, look, I got nothing to mitigate. My attorney said, you let me handle this. The difference between somebody that does their all, whatever it is, whatever their profession, whatever they're doing, they do their best, the utmost, till the end. He said, you let me handle this. For the next two hours, he went over all the piece of evidence that came out over that, during that trial. Why footprints in the kitchen? Same footprints on, the, on the, it's a Mexican towel floor like that was in both the kitchen and bathroom. They'd actually taken a magic dust and, and a black light and got a perfect shoe print. Went out and bought a shoe to match that exact print, a size nine and a half Converse, exact perfect match. I wear a size 11, my bare foot was bigger than that whole shoe. Why fingerprints and palm prints in the men's bathroom where Kim's body was found with the knife, the murder weapon, a butcher knife that would have been taken from the kitchen where that murder knife was, was washed and dried and hidden underneath the, paper, or, uh, underneath the trash can? Why those fingerprints and palm prints did not match me? Why hair and DNA on her body did not match me? When he was done, the judge said this case was going to haunt him for the rest of his life. He said it was hard for him to believe that somebody with my background and, and could have committed this horrible crime. He said that he had lingering and residual doubt of my guilt. He wasn't sure that I did it. So he sentenced me to 25 to life instead. Will be, thank you very much. 25 to life I was now getting, same victim of course, same alleged perpetrator. But now because the judge wasn't sure that I'd done it, I wasn't going to get executed, I wasn't going to be laid on a gurney and have a lethal cocktail shot in my veins courtesy of the state of Arizona. No, 25 to life for the murder. That's pretty generous, right? Then he went on to sentence me to 21 more for the kidnapping and ran consecutive. For any of you who know a little bit, that means 25 plus 21. 46 years I was facing, minimum, before I ever had my first shot at parole. 46 years, minimum. I was 35 when it happened. You can go ahead and add that together. That was a death sentence. And as I say, I might not give you go to the execution chamber, but I wasn't going to live to be 81 years old, not in prison, not to violence, the very segregated, very racist. They are run by gangs, not only the inmates, but the guards are dangerous. I've been through my share of riots. I've been stabbed a number of times. I know what it's like to survive in the walls and a life sentence. 25 to life plus 21 more. So off I went. My family and friends stood by me. My attorney looked into things. A couple years went by. My appeal gets turned down. They said I had a fair trial. Nothing to appeal. 
So I'm thinking, ain't this something? I'm going to die in prison. But my family and friends stood by me, kept giving me strength, even in some of my weaker moments. And I see in the newspaper or on the TV that somebody be released because of DNA, and I, I kind of get excited on one hand. I'm thinking, yeah, that could be me one day because I'm innocent too. And then I think, oh, yeah, on the other hand, it's like, yeah, a lot of good DNA did me. And I'm surviving, and my family and friends are hanging in there, and time is going by. Finally, in 2001, the Arizona State Legislature has passed a new law, recognizing the, the possibility, the reliability, the, the valuableness of DNA, and that some states, and then you can't come up, bring up new evidence after a certain time period. You're limited to know about it, and, and you know, this year, next year, or that's it, you can't ever bring it in again. And they recognize that DNA doesn't always work that way. And they made a new law uh, stating that uh, you could bring up new DNA evidence at any time, provided you could prove that it was, excuse me, they proved that it was preserved and it, and it had relevance, direct relevance to guilt or innocence. We were able to find out, thankfully, that the Phoenix Police Department had kept Kim's clothing. They'd been cut off of her and thrown in the corner of that men's bathroom. They kept it and preserved it. They still had it in the evidence locker. And so my attorney was one of the first people to petition him under that post-conviction relief, asking for DNA testing to be done in her clothing. And there was a court hearing. I wasn't there. I was in prison. But there was a court hearing my attorney attended. And during that time, the prosecution, the attorney general's office spoke up, said, don't grant this motion, Your Honor. It's a wild goose chase. It's a fishing expedition. It's a waste of the court's time and money. crone has been convicted twice of a jury of his peers. Overwhelming evidence of his guilt, Your Honor. There's no need for this. Don't grant this motion. For whatever reason, that judge did order that DNA testing to be done. He went on to order the Phoenix Police Department's recently accredited DNA lab to do that DNA testing. After all, I've been through the last people in the world I wanted to touch anything was the Phoenix Police Department. But as some things are amazing are in the world, it turned out to be a blessing, a silver lining, if you will. The, darkness before the light. Because see, law enforcement agencies are the only people that had access to the nationwide DNA data bank. Just like fingerprints are taken and stored all over the country and all accessible from any one point, DNA was now being handled the same way. In fact, in Arizona, the law had been passed that anybody convicted of a murder or a sexual offense was required to give a blood sample. I think Arizona had about 16,000 themselves in that DNA data bank, plus the rest of the country. So when this crime lab technician found samples on her underwear, on her jeans, extracted it, it was DNA, compared that DNA from both sources, it was the same DNA. She compared it to Kim, it wasn't Kim's. Compared it to me, and it wasn't me. And I have to say, God bless this overachiever, you go girl. She took that DNA and she put it in a nationwide data bank that was right there next to her. Just plugged it in to see what would happen, because she wasn't required to do that by the court order. And that thing whirled and whizzed and hissed or whatever the heck they do. And it came back and it spit out a result. It spit out a match to a man that was at that very moment serving a 10-year sentence for having sexually assaulted a child just a few months after the murder. A man who was actually on parole at the time of the murder from another sexual offense four or so years earlier was paroled to his mom's house within a few blocks of the bar in Phoenix, Arizona. We got that information. We went to see this man, Mr. Kenneth Phillips. He was just a few months away from being released from his 10-year sentence. My investigator went down to talk to him in a sexual predator's yard, and the man denied. He was an American Indian. He, he uh, had a real problem with drugs and alcohol, had a real bad history, upbringing. My investigator went to talk to him, and he, of course, denied ever being there, didn't know anything about it. My investigator was ex-homicide detective from Imperial County in California. He was an experienced interrogator, if you will. He kept talking with Mr. Phillips. Finally, Mr. Phillips admitted that, that he did have an alcohol problem, that he blacked out, that he remembered getting an argument over the bathroom. He went on to say he remembered waking up, had blood all over him, wondering, my God, what did I do? This was all recorded. Now, that's called an admission of guilt. It's not a confession. He didn't say, I killed her. But he did relate elements of the crime, facts of the crime. It's an admission of guilt. It was recorded. With that DNA results, with that admission of guilt, Evidence. Didn't care one bit about the truth. Didn't care one, one bit about what my 
my attorney investigator at, at, at going covered and dug up. Not one bit. Fortunately to me, there was somebody in Arizona that did care. Local reporter found out about the story. I don't know, I don't know anything about how that would happen. <laughs> Local reporter, crime reporter for the Arizona Republic, which says, you know, Phoenix is about the fourth or fifth largest city in the U.S. There was a lot of people reading his newspaper. She worked on it a couple of days. The next thing, front page, banner headlines, how recent DNA testing pointed to a man with no sexual history who violence towards women, how me, Ray Kerr, who had been on death row, still serving life sentence for something he clearly didn't do. Very well written, very persuasive, very powerful, very truthful. It's embarrassing for the police the prosecution. Next day, I, I was actually on the yard at that time in Yuma, Arizona. I got uh, called over the There's an attorney on the phone for you. Very snappish, like a very smart alecky in a way. And, I answered the phone, and it was Alan Simpson. And he said, Ray, how are you doing today? I said, fine, just another day in paradise. And it's what he did. He kind of laughed. He said, well, what are you hungry for? I said, what do you mean? I'm going to eat whatever's in the chow hall. He said, no, really, what do you want? Steak, seafood, Mexican food, beer? What would you like, Ray? I said, Alan, what the devil are you talking about? He said, I just got off the phone with the prosecutor's office. They just got back from the judge's chambers. They're cutting the paperwork. You're coming home today, Ray. My knees shook, I couldn't already speak. I, what did you just say? He said, roll up, Ray, it's all over, you're coming home. Four hours later, I walked out of that prison, folks, looking over my shoulder and wondering, what are they up to now? I had no reason to trust him, no reason to believe in him. The man that left escorted me out was actually a sergeant at the time of death row. He was the man that read the riot act to me the day, the first day I got to death row. This man was now a deputy warden, was walking me out of there. He said, I'd heard about you back then. He said, I never believed it. The people, the inmates were lining up along the fence, cheering and yelling, go home, Ray Crone, because there was an article in the newspaper then about this, and they'd seen it. My attorney, Chris Plord, my second trial attorney, was in El Centro at the time, which isn't far from you, but he came over, met me inside there, and did the paperwork, and carried me outside that gate. I start my life all over again at the age of 45, and reunite with my family and friends. And also, as it turned out, as you'd heard, a distinction of being the 100th man in at that time, man, there are women now. There is a woman now, but the 100th person in America to have been sentenced to death, later on to be free, to be exonerated, to be shown to be innocent. 100 mistakes we had made. A lot of the groups are fighting abolitionists, are fighting for abolition. A lot of groups have been waiting for that number. Apparently, 100 is a milestone. It is important. It's not 99. It's not 101. I can tell you, my little sister was taken up to Dickinson Law School, close to where I grew up in Pennsylvania. They lit 100 candles in recognition of the 100 mistakes. They actually lit up the Colosseum in Rome for my release. Uh, that's not just for me. They do that for other release. They do it when states abolish death penalty only. Also, so it wasn't just Ray Krohn lighting the Colosseum. But there was the media waiting for me. Asked me a lot of questions. What was it like? How did you survive? How do you feel? And of course, I talked about my family and friends support me, how I read the Bible front to back three and a half times during those 10 years, slept with it under my pillow. I'd look for help anywhere I could get it. And you know, I certainly I found the strength through, the, through those passages. And a reporter in the back raised his hand. He said, well, well, Mr. Crone, given your faith in God, how do you justify him leaving you in prison for 10 years? <laughs> but how do I justify God leaving me in prison for 10 years? How do you answer a deep, soul-searching question like that? Especially when you just walked out of prison where they can't really... I, I, I'm dumbfounded. I'm stupid. I'm just like frozen. And all the microphones, the, the cameras, the lights are all shining on me. And, uh, there's nothing there. Uh, and all of a sudden, something shot into my head. I said, well, you know, maybe it's not about those 10 years I spent in prison. Maybe it's about what I got to do the next 10 years. I had time to think about it later. Maybe there was a reason for this happening to me. Maybe there was a point. I, believe me, I was perfectly happy being a mailman. I'd be retired right now. I'd be, but I, I, maybe there was a reason, because if they can do it to me, they can do it to anybody. And so I've traveled and spoken about what has happened to me since then, part for my therapy, part for, for my family and, and friends, I guess, if you will, admiration or, or at least uh, security for them to, to not be worried or frightened what, what did prison do to me? How's it going to be? How's he going to react? He should be mad, he should be angry. I have a right to be angry. I have a right to be mad, if you will. But you know what, that's not the, those are not the type of feelings that we make our best decisions are. And they had control over me for 10 years. I'm free now, I'm not gonna let them, that hate, that anger, that frustration continue to control me. 
It's like driving down the road. You don't look out your rearview mirror all the time to see what you missed, but see what you left behind you. It's what's in front of you that's important. Keep focused in front. So I have been fortunate to be able to speak. I have been in People Magazine, been in USA Today. I, I've been in Good Morning America. I've been in both United Nations, uh, and it's certainly some for a, for a guy from a small town. But most of all, I've been healing. And it's thanks to people like you that come out and want to hear my story, to see the looks in your face, the eyes, the, the encouragement you give me to keep doing this. Those 10 years don't just go away the day you walk out of prison. There's good people and bad people everywhere. The good ones need to stay, stay together and stay strong, just like my little small town that supported me and my family. And I know you all are sitting out there. And in closing, I want to leave you with this. Actually, I'm going to leave you with two things. One is whatever it is you've seen in life that you disagree with, that you, you think is wrong, don't ever be afraid to find people of, of equal faith, equal belief, and stand up and make a difference. Let your voice be heard. Have, take action against something you see. Make a change. And think of my little handful of family and friends in Pennsylvania didn't know nothing about the justice system. They believed in me. They knew me. They took on the justice system of the state of Arizona. And they persevered and they won. You think of the knowledge, the abilities that's right here in this room, what you have to can accomplish, what you can do. Don't be afraid to take that stand. There's other people out there that will be right there with you. And lastly, you know, we're all going to have our trials and tribulations in life. There's challenges out there, big, small. Sometimes we make them bigger than they are. Sometimes they are, are bigger than we think. Maybe they're behind for some of us. Maybe they're still ahead for some of us. We don't know. But I'm telling you, some of those times and those things come up to you and you wonder, why me? What do I do to deserve this? Why do I go on? I can't take this anymore. Remember my story. And there's 139 other stories now. There's been 40 more people released from death row since my release in 2002. All of them have a similar story. It was tough for all of them, folks. Tough for all of us. Find strength in what we endured what, and believe that you can endure it too. And most of all, believe that there's a purpose. There's a reason for it. For all of us, there's something we can do, something we can give. And I can tell you from personal period, that sure makes me feel good. So thank you and good luck to all of you. Okay, we've got time for a couple of questions. If you would raise your hand and wait for the microphone to get to you. Here's a question right over here. I really appreciate you being here. And one question I have, I've been doing a lot of research about test lion. How familiar are you with that? And how much have you seen of it? Test of lion. What it is is cops deliberately lying on police reports. Oh to garner convictions and the cynicism from some judicial systems about well, it. Well, clearly with their intelligence and training, they have that person is guilty, so it's justified. You change the report to make sure you get convictions. These are bad people they do. Uh, isn't that a shame when people think like that? Uh, it's scary because it could be you one day. <coughs> that's really what I believe it is about. Uh, I don't know, uh, I haven't met that wisest person in the world yet to this day that you know, knows everything and can make that determination. But also, I know this, they're under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. The more publicized it is, the more important it is, the more pressure might be coming down from everything from City Hall up to, to the own police chief up. They need to get, 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 uh, get at least charge somebody and charge somebody fast. And shamefully, what I found out is once you're charged, you might as well have done it, because very rarely do you ever get let go again. It's not like we read a great detective novel or, or see a great TV story about a detective goes down so many dead ends, follows so many leads, eventually gets that right lead, you know, sifts through all the information, gets, eventually finds the right lead, finds the right person, just, you know, the crime is solved. Uh, unfortunately, my experience, and I've, I also uh, I belong to Witness to Innocence, which is a group of uh, uh, death row exonerates from all over the U.S. Uh, women, as I said, that went through this with me. Um, the number of, of similarities, the familiarity, what, what happened to me is exactly what happened in most of these cases. Police misconduct and prosecution misconduct is common in almost every one of them.
But you know what? If nothing happens to you, why wouldn't? If you could cheat a card, or if you could gamble in the lottery and, and win most of the time, and nothing's going to happen to you, where, where's the, the, you know, the, the deterrent effect? Uh, where, what's to stop you? Uh, most of the time, you're treated as a hero, and the jury wants to believe he's a police officer. You can't blame them. Unfortunately, as in every any profession, they're not all perfect. We are human. We have our own needs, our own mistakes uh, that are made. Uh, the question is not about the fact you make a mistake, it's what you do when you learn that mistake. Do you lie about it? Do you cover it up? Do you hide it? Or do you come forward and admit it? And that's what it was. We got to be able to encourage them to be able to come forward and not uh, be chastised, not lose their job. But you know, there's no justice if it's not truth. And there's no justice if it's not fair. Uh, it is a problem, but thankfully, again, in the 10 years I've been out, I've seen things changing. I honestly believe most cops are and do want to, want to have just a want to be, be right. But I think all of us can succumb to certain other pressures and, uh, that, that we, we make a bad decision at times. Another question? You got a question? Yes. I oppose the death penalty itself with no exceptions, guilty or innocent. Has your experience changed how you feel about the death penalty for the guilty? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, again, it's some things where you say, to, well, well, there's got to be a line. What about in this case and what about in this case? And while anything can even be clear cut, it's one of those things I said, look, it just can't work. I, I don't believe in a government that's a democracy that, that we gave our government permission to, to kill its own citizens. I think there's something wrong in a government that, 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 that actually took the power from the people to say, we can decide who can live and who should die. And as I said earlier, I never met a person who was that smart you know, to deal with, and, and I certainly don't know a person who should be able to decide to live and die. And the same government I can't even trust to fix the pothole in front of my house for weeks or months at a time. Uh, so, and that's just a, you know, a, a, an issue I was just talking about on, on practicality wise. I mean, can they get it right? They, they can. If it's, what if it's filmed? All this. I mean, even on the practicality, not going into moral issues of saying, you know, uh, well, you know, leave that up to God. Or when, when somebody's executed, what do they say? This is for the good people of the state of Arizona. When they're doing an execution, they name that the people of that state as the people that are carrying out the, this for. Uh, I know, you know, what it's like to be accused of murder. I know what it's like to live around murders. I don't want to be a murderer. I don't want them killing anybody in my name. Let me just say that uh, tomorrow uh, at noon in room 323, I think I got that right, the Bowen Law School, there's a panel discussion on innocence and the death penalty. It's open to the public. Lunch is provided. Ray is speaking along with Professor Sullivan from the law school. Uh, and someone from the Federal Public Defender's Office and, and the State Public Defender's Office. So if you want to uh, uh, continue this dialogue and discussion, I might also say two, another thing is that we have a team of students, Ray, that are working um, with the Federal Public Defender's Office uh, on uh, re-entry uh, programs. We might be a great source for them. A couple of Chet's here, Chris is here. There are a couple of members of that team that are here that are Clint School students uh, that may want to talk with you tonight. And finally, before we conclude, I want to say, I've been to a lot of these programs that, you know, obviously this guy was really, really good. But Lindsay gave one of the best introductions I've ever seen for a <laughs> 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 That was really good. And we're honored to have you, and you make our school proud. Ladies and gentlemen, Ray Crone, thank you very much. Thank you.